I want to begin this morning with a question. What is it that makes us want to sin? Uh, Let's all set aside our egos for one moment uh, and be honest. Uh, We know that everyone sins. The Bible tells us that, but we know it anyway, don't we? Uh, We know it firsthand. All of us have sinned and fallen short, right? But why? What makes a person gossip about even someone they call a friend? What makes a husband or wife choose to be unfaithful to his or her spouse? What makes us in times of pain turn to something destructive that hurts us like drugs or alcohol or pornography or something like that, things that people commonly become addicted to? Uh, What makes us choose to lie when we could tell the truth and we know the truth? What makes us want to covet someone else for their possessions or their qualities or their, their status in life or something like that? What makes us jealous and covetous? What tempts us to steal, to take something that is not mine? You know, a lot of times we, we say things when we th- talk about this, you know, why, why do we do these things? Something like, well, you know, I, I or he or she, they fell in with the wrong crowd. Or, well, you know, just it was my moment of weakness or something like that. Um, But there's something deeper, isn't there? Those aren't really answers. Um, The question might be, well, what made the crowd have power over you so that when you fell into the wrong crowd, you did what was wrong, right? Why didn't you just spend time with that crowd and not do what you knew wasn't right? Or what was it that made you weak in that moment? Yes, we, we've sinned sometimes because we're weak, but what is it that uh, makes us vulnerable when we are weak rather than in our weakness turning to the Lord and, and finding His strength, right? We need to go a little deeper. Um, I think there is a, a deeper reason that behind many sins, it is the real reason that we are tempted to do things that we shouldn't. Um, I think it's harder to admit. It's a little bit... It's a little bit scarier to say this out loud. It's easy to say, well, I just fell into some bad influence or I was just being weak. The the truth is, I think if we were honest, the reason oftentimes we are tempted to sin is this. I don't believe God cares about me enough that I can trust him to do what is best for me. Isn't that oftentimes the reason we sin? Don't we oftentimes lie Because we're afraid if we tell the truth, it's going to be very costly and it will be bad for us. Even though God has said, tell the truth, don't lie. I believe the reason we are tempted to lie or cheat or steal or gossip or slander other people or do things we know are destructive to us and give in to addictive behaviors are because we do not trust God to take the best care of us. I believe what we really do is we are are giving in to the same temptation that was under the original sin in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Uh, If you remember that story and you're familiar with it, Satan lied to Adam and Eve in the Garden. He, He cast doubt on God's goodness. He said, did God really say you can't eat the fruit of that tree? And he told Eve, he said, Eve, you should eat it because if you do, your eyes will be opened to what God's been trying to hold back so that you couldn't be like him. And the lie was, if you eat that, you will be God. You will be your own God. You will be like God. I think the power of temptation always goes hand in hand with a doubt of God's love for us. Every time we choose to do our way, we're just imitating Eve and imitating Adam who were tempted to distrust God and his commands and his goodness, thinking we know better what is best for us. So today we are finishing a study of the book of 1 Peter. If you're here for the first time, um, you, you get all the good stuff right at the end. You didn't have to sit through did many sermons before, uh, but we are, we're finishing a study we've been doing for several months. And this last sermon, this last part of First Peter is all about standing firm, remaining faithful to God, 
through adversity, through persecution, through hardship, with one simple reminder really at the heart of this message and the whole book, he cares for you. And because he does, you can trust him and you can trust him by obeying him. So we're going to read today. If you have your Bible and like to read along, uh, we will have the verses on the screen, but you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll give you a second to do that if you do want to read along in your own Bible. Again, 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to be reading verses 6 through 14 at the end of the book. This is God's Word. Let us listen together. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering that are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, he will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So in this closing uh, section we're reading today of 1 Peter, we have what I will leave with us a command, a warning, and a promise. We have a command to humble ourselves under God. We have a warning to resist the devil. And then we have a promise that God will glorify you. God will glorify his people. Uh, That might be a helpful formula for us to take with us, something we can take from 1 Peter, uh, in the face of the adversities that we are facing and are going to face in life, God's given us a command, he's given us a warning, and he's given us his promises. Humble ourselves, resist the devil, and trust God's promises. Humble, resist, and trust. So we start with this, this command, and we looked at it last week a little bit, to humble ourselves. Uh, I think Peter gives us some really good insight into what it means to humble ourselves and why it is that we can, can confidently humble ourselves under God. He, he says, God is supremely powerful So you can humble yourselves under him because he has a mighty hand. You know, it would be one thing to submit to a God that wasn't powerful. I wouldn't encourage you to do that. But our God is the almighty, right? That's the word we use. I would encourage you, call him that, right? When you feel weak or you feel frightened or you're wondering if you can trust God with something that seems too big, you remind yourself he is the almighty that he is powerful, and because he is powerful, we can submit to him and sleep well. Uh, This past week, in case you didn't know, a hurricane hit Florida. Uh, I doubt you, some of you, if you don't have a TV or a phone or friends or anything, uh, you might not know that. Uh, I have a brother and sister-in-law and a niece, and they live in Tallahassee, Florida. And it was almost right in the path of of Hurricane Idalia. It wasn't quite for a while they were worried it was going to be the direct landing spot. It hit Keaton Beach, which was about 80 miles away. They were very much in the the path of it. They actually, and my brother has lived there for many years, and I don't remember them ever leaving. They left this time, and they spent the night in their truck in a parking lot at Walmart in Dothan, Alabama. Uh, 
So they, they took it seriously, and they should have because that storm was powerful. Um, and, you know, we, we see hurricanes coming. It's one of those things you know in advance. How many of you prayed for people or for Florida or something like that? I'll bet a lot of people did, right? Um, when do you pray, right? Uh, you know, sometimes we pray God send it, you know, where it never goes over land or something like that. You know, you can't. What I prayed this past week was I prayed for my family. I prayed for people that are in Florida. I prayed for the people in the path of it. But you know what I also prayed in addition to their safety? I prayed, God, let people see your power and turn to you. Because aren't these things evidence to us that in all of creation there is tremendous power, right? God created everything. Uh, unfortunately, because of our sin, all of creation has now been affected by sin. It groans under the weight of sin. There will be a day when hurricanes won't, I don't know if they'll still exist, but they won't hurt people, right? But as long as we await Jesus, who's going to return to restore all of creation, including the physical world, to its original purpose of, of no sin, no suffering, all of these things, my prayer is, God, let us see power when it is both happening for good and for things that we consider bad. And, Lord, let us turn to the Almighty, right? So as that storm approached, my prayer was that all of us would behold the power of the Almighty and submit to Him. And to, that God would use this hurricane to bring people to trust Him. God is powerful. His power is on display all of the time in all of creation. And according to 1 Peter, God will use his infinite power to exalt those of us that will trust him. Peter says we can also humble ourselves under God, not just because he's powerful, but because he is all wise. God has all wisdom. I know some of us here think we're smart. Does anybody here think you know it all? <laughs> Does anyone here know someone they think knows it all, right? Janice, do you want to testify who that is? Oh, okay. Not on camera. Um, I think all of us probably sometimes struggle with being know-it-alls, but it, it doesn't take long to realize you don't, does it? Uh, but I love how Peter here, he... he sort of subtly reminds us that we can humble ourselves under God because he is infinitely wise. And he says in this passage that we can uh, uh, submit to him because at the proper time, he will exalt us. Whose timing is perfect? God's, right? How often is sin the result of not trusting God's timing? Yes, <laughs> always. Thank you. You want to come over here and preach? Because amen. Thank you, Audrey. Not trusting his perfect timing, which is a product of his perfect wisdom. So often the temptation to sin is, Lord, I know you're powerful, but you're not, you're not doing this on the right time frame, so I better do something. I can't just wait around, Lord. I better take matters into my own hand. Sometimes the greatest challenge is to keep waiting while everything in us says, how long, oh Lord, how long? You and I are going to be tempted. We're going to be tempted to give up our trust in his wisdom and in his perfect timing. But humility says, submit yourself to the one who is powerful and whose timing is perfect, whose wisdom is perfect, who knows better than you. There's one know-it-all. That is God. And he is not a know-it-all in the negative sense at all. He is the one that knows everything. And we can trust him. Peter also says we should humble ourselves under God because not just because of his power, not just because of his wisdom, but because of his goodness, his mercy, his compassion, and his grace. And the way that Peter says this is you may come to him and cast all of your anxieties upon him. Isn't it nice to know that when we come to the Lord burdened and weary, he does not turn us away. He does not say, well, I can't believe you're worried about that. You're so dumb. Don't you have any faith? Well, I don't even know why I ever let you become my child. You know, he, he does not cast us away, 
He says to bring all of your anxieties upon him. I love that all there. That is a really encouraging word. Uh, we were eating dinner. James is home visiting with us, uh, which has been fantastic. Um, and we were having dinner, the, the four of us, Lori and James and Ellie. That's my son, if you don't know James, and my daughter Ellie. And they were talking about a, a Bible study they had had in youth sometime over the course of the last year or so. And they said the discussion came up about this, like, should we pray about even little things, like, like maybe the outcome of a football game? Right? And Sue Long today asked me to pray that LSU would beat Florida State. And I said, no, I'm not praying that. Because <laughs> we know that the Lord likes Florida State better. <laughs> no, she didn't really say that. She said, should I bring you some Kleenex tonight is what she said. Um, but they, the youth were discussing this, like, should we pray? And there apparently was some disagreement about this. And one of the comments was that someone had said something like, God has better things to do with his time than, than listen to us praying about the outcome of football games, right? I, I would agree that the, the outcome of a football game may not be that important, but I disagree with this, that there is anything that can burden God when it comes to time, right? He's all-powerful, right? He exists outside of time. Do we have to worry about God not having time for me? No. No, no, you can bring all of your anxiety. So we need to get rid of this idea that, well, that, that's really not that important. I probably shouldn't pray about it. Look, if it is holding you back, if it is causing you distress, if it is, if it is testing your faith, then take it to him. In Galilee, if it's LSU and FSU, take it to him. Now, he might say, my son, I don't really care who wins, right? And I don't want you to worry about who wins, you know, just relax. I don't know, his answer might not be what I want. But you can take all of your anxieties. Why? Because he cares for you. Because he is gracious. Because he is compassionate. And isn't it wonderful to know that when we come to him with what might seem silly to someone else, he cares. And when we come with things that that seem impossible, he cares. And he reminds us with me, nothing is impossible. And he says, you bring every anxiety to me. You and I, we cannot waste God's time. We can waste our time. And God might help us to to mature and grow and say, hey, look, you know what? You've been praying a lot about this thing. There's some other things that I think really are more important. He'll help you understand that, right? If you're wasting your time, but you can't waste his time. And praying to him about anything is never a waste of his time. All of these things God gives us, in order that we can confidently humble ourselves, his power, his wisdom, and his mercy. Why? Because he cares for us. I want you, I don't do this a lot. I'm not one to say that. Repeat after me, but I want you and I to say this to see if we believe it, because I want to know if this feels weird to you or natural to say, and I want you to say with me, God cares for me. Let's say it. God cares for me. Do you believe that? Do you doubt it sometimes? Yeah. Keep saying it. God cares for me. You don't have to say it out loud. I mean, that was, I'm sorry. Bad instructions from me. Bad instructions. In your life, affirm this. God cares for me. I I heard there was a a guy who passed away several years ago. He was a great Bible teacher, preacher, theologian. And someone asked him one time about his prayer life. And he said, well, he said, it depends on the day. He said, there are some days I'm so busy that, Uh, my prayer life, it just consists of I wake up and he says, and I sit on the side of my bed and I say, the Lord is here. And then I get up and shower and catch the plane because I had to get up real early or something like that, right? I think this is one of those kind of things that could be the prayer you wake up and you say, he cares for me. If you don't have, you know, 20, 30 minutes to spend reading the Bible that morning, you can wake up and say that first thing. Thank you, God, that you care for me. So, Peter says, God cares for you. Then he says, but there's one who does not care for you. And you need to be aware of that. Peter says that in addition to this command to humble ourselves, we should heed the warning that there is an enemy that doesn't care for us at all. And he is the one that is telling us, you can be your own God. You don't need to cast your anxieties on him. Do it. You've got the power to do it yourself. You don't need him. He's not telling the truth. He doesn't really care for you. You care for you. And you need to take matters into your own hand. Now, I love that Peter says uh, in this passage, 
that we are to be sober-minded, we are to be watchful. Basically, we are to be alert and aware. But he, notice he does not say afraid, does he? Nowhere in the Bible are we told to be afraid of the enemy. We're to be sober-minded. That just means think very clearly. Take this seriously. It's important. We're to be watchful. That means you're to be on guard. You're to be alert. You're not to let your guard down. You're not to be lazy, but not afraid. But he says there is an enemy, the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, God cares for you, but you've got an enemy who's trying to tempt you And he does not care for you. In fact, he hates you. And his goal, according to this passage, is that he wants to devour or destroy you. And Jesus himself said that the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we need to remember, and we need to to take this seriously, every temptation to sin is to choose to believe the one that hates us rather than the one that loves us. It is to choose to believe the one who wants to destroy us rather than the one that cares for us. But he's crafty. He will find that weakness and he will do his very best to try to tempt you, to make it sound good and to make it feel good that you know best what is best for you. But that is not true. Whose wisdom do we trust? Ours or the Lord's? The Lord's. And I love this. The strategy to deal with the devil is really simple. Resist, resist, resist right? It's like the shampoo. You ever look at that? You know, put it on, lather, rinse, repeat. I always think that's just a way to sell more shampoo. Why am I doing that twice? I'm too cheap to do that. Um, But with the devil, keep doing it. Resist. Resist. That's it. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to come up with a battle plan. You don't have to be strong. You resist. There's one author I read years ago, and I've never forgotten this. He, He uh, is a Christian pastor and counselor, and he said he had learned over the years that when it comes to dealing with the enemy, he said it is not a power encounter, it is a truth encounter. The weapon of Satan is his lie, right? That's what he used in the, the garden. Jesus said he is the father of lies. And what is the we- if his weapon is the lie, what is your weapon? The truth, right? The truth. We don't have to worry about how powerful. In fact, we will find that most times we are most powerful when we acknowledge our weakness the most, right? When we are the humblest and realize how weak we are, that is when we are strong because that is when we draw near to God and when we trust his power. And so Peter says, resist. It is crucial for us in dealing with the one who is a liar to know the truth. That is why it is important for us to study the word, to hear the word, to worship the word, to sing the word, to assemble like this this morning around God's word, all of these things over and over and over because this this kind of life of continually hearing God's word, doing God's word, praying God's word, worshiping God's word, assembling around God's word and exalting God's word and all of these things, that will empower us to resist the liar who wants to destroy us and to draw near to the one who cares for us. And Peter says, resist and stand firm in your faith. To stand firm, you've got to know what you believe, why you believe it, and then you've got to practice it and you've got to reaffirm it. You've got to submit to the Lord over and over and over. It's not one-time thing. It is a lifetime thing. And all you have to do when it comes to the enemy is resist. As we humble ourselves under God's power and his wisdom and his grace, And as we resist the devil firm in our faith, there's a command, there's a warning, then we have the promise that we can trust our God who cares for us. We can trust him with everything, our lives past, present, and future, forgiveness of our sins in the past, strength we need right now, and the assurance of our future with him in glory because of what Jesus Christ has done. After we suffer for a little while, Peter says, and he puts it into perspective, it's, it's, it's in the scheme of things, it is shorter than you think. After we suffer for a little while, the God of all grace, that God who has called us to his eternal glory in Christ, he himself will restore us, confirm us, strengthen us, and establish us. Isn't that wonderful to know God has promised you can be confirmed, strengthened, restored, and established. And all of this for an eternity with him, 
right? Because his glory that he's called us to, Peter said, is eternal in Christ Jesus. See, we have a lot of time ahead of us where we're not going to have to resist anymore. We're not going to have to struggle against sin anymore. Is but we've got this, this, this season right now for a little while. Don't grow weary. Don't stop. He himself will confirm us, restore us, strengthen us, and establish us. And I love how holistic and complete this is of what God is doing for you and for me today if we have trusted in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, you think about restoring something. That looks back, right? To restore means to bring something back to its original intended good purposes and condition, right? So that, that, that looks at what God has done to rescue us from our lostness, to pull us out of our sin, to rescue us from hopelessness, and to give us life. He's restoring us. He's bringing us back into the, that, that, that life and that joy, that love that he created us for. And then presently, I, I look at these words that God, he himself is going not only to, to uh, restore us, but he is also going to confirm us and strengthen us. That confirm to me is, is sort of like God assuring us over and over who we are and who he is, right? Let me confirm. Sometimes you need confirmation, don't you? Lord, today, confirm for me I'm doing the right thing. Confirm to me, God, I'm on the right path. Confirm to me, God, I haven't missed something along the way and gone astray, right? Sometimes you need, God, that confirmation to keep you going. And certainly you need that strength, don't you? Mm-hmm. We need more strength than we've got. Let me tell you, I bet if, if you've been a Christian for very long, you will realize this. Your strength is not sufficient for your walk with Jesus Christ. And thank God it doesn't depend on our strength. It depends on whose? His. And we can be like Paul. We'll say, look, it is when I am the, the most weak that I realize how strong he is. It is at my weakest that his strength is made perfect in me. And praise God, you and I don't have to be strong. We have to be humble right? And when we are, he will strengthen us. He will give us the strength that we don't have. And then that forward-looking reality of he's strengthening us, not just for today, but for eternity. He is establishing us. That word establish is the same word used for like building a foundation. Remember Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, now whoever listens to my word is like the one who built their house on the firm foundation. That's what God is doing. God is establishing you setting you on the proper rock of Jesus Christ so that you will stand through every storm and you will endure and you will see God fulfill every promise, every plan, every purpose that he has made for you. So God, what he's doing today is establishing us for eternity, for our future with him. As Peter has said several times in this book, and he said it again in this passage today, and I know you're tired of hearing it, Look, Christians, hardships are going to come. You and I are going to face in life difficulties. Some will be of the garden variety that every human being faces, but some of them, and this is what Peter is talking about even more, some of them are going to be uniquely because we are believers, right? Because we're believers with an enemy and the world rejected Jesus, they will reject us. And Peter reminded them, he says, the same kind of suffering you are experiencing, it is common all around the world, it was then and it still is. Wherever you find Christians, you will find Christians that get made fun of, that get mocked, that get rejected, that get treated differently, that get mistreated, that get persecuted sometimes, depending on where you live, and it's in varying degrees. But we've already, we've already seen this book wasn't written to people being burned at the stake. It was being to people who were undergoing the same kind of thing we do, common types of powerful influence, things like rejecting you trying to criticize you, trying to attack you and say you're the one who's evil because of your faith in Christ. You're, you're a bigot, you're exclusionary, something like this, right? We've been reminded again, Peter tells us once again, the hardships are going to come. It's always been that way. It always will. But there is a reason that we should endure. There is a reason we should humble ourselves. There's a reason, reason we should resist the devil. There's a reason we should trust God's promises, and it is this, he is worth it. Do you believe that? Is God great enough that he's worth enduring the hardships, resisting the enemy, humbling yourself under his power and his wisdom and his grace? 
Is, is God worth it for you to endure for a little while the suffering when it comes? Rather than saying, all right, look, God, you, you don't care for me as much as I do, so I better do something about this to put an end to it, right? Peter says, to him, this one that has promised our glory, this one that has promised to confirm and restore and strengthen and establish, to him be the dominion forever and ever. What does dominion mean? It means he's in charge. God, I'll humble myself and I will submit to you and your rule and your dominion forever and ever because you are worth it. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we should submit to God, resist the enemy. We should do it when the hardships come. We should trust his promises, and we should count him worthy of all of these things because... He cares for us. And there's one verse I want to leave you with because so many times in my life and in ministry, when, when the temptations come and you think, does God really care about me? God, can I really trust you to obey and this isn't going to destroy me? Can I really trust that doing it your way is the right way? Those, those thoughts come, don't they? Whether you think them out loud or not, every temptation that, you, that has any power over you comes with that with the lie that God does not really care about you as much as you do. And I like to remind myself with this verse that Paul wrote in Romans, and I'll leave it with us. When you wonder, does he really care for me? Remember this. What then shall we say to these things? And these things Paul meant when all of the hardships of life come. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? When you are tempted to wonder if God really cares for you, you and I, we need to look at the cross. And we need to say, if God cared enough about me to give his only son, who was perfect and sinless, but who came to forgive sinners like me, to take my sin upon himself. If God was willing to do that before I even was his friend and yet was his enemy, even in my rebellion, God sent his precious son and he gave him for all of us. Can't we trust him now to give us everything we would need? Because I'll tell you this, whatever he gives you now, nothing is as costly as what he gave when he sent his son to the cross. That is how much he loves you. And that is the proof that he loves you. And he is worthy of our obedience through the good times and the bad. And let's ask him today to help us to humble ourselves under his mighty hand, to resist the enemy, and to believe and trust his promises. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for these wonderful brothers and sisters that have gathered here today. Lord, who want to live our lives in obedience to you. Lord, you know that it's hard. Lord, I thank you that your word addresses the realities of life, that it is not some pie in the sky sort of holy talk, but Lord, it is real. Lord, you know that in our lives, the temptations are fierce, God, to do it our way, just like our forefather and foremother, Adam and Eve, Lord, in the garden. Lord, they gave in to the lie that they could be gods themselves, that they could know what was best and even better than you. Lord, we confess today our sins that we still struggle. We are still Adams and Eves, Lord, standing, staring at the forbidden fruit, listening to the lie that we should do it our way. But Father, we thank you that you still care for us, that you still cared for Adam and Eve. We thank you that sin was not the end of the story, nor was death, but rather, Lord, Jesus came that we might have life. We thank you, Lord, that you love your creation. You love every person who is a part of it. And, Lord, you have given your son for us all. I pray today, Lord, that we would believe that you care for us. That, God, we would believe that you care for us and we would know it because you gave Jesus Christ. And, Lord, that now we will experience it as you give us all the things that we need, none of which could ever compare to your precious son, our Savior, Jesus Lord, forgive us for the times that we have failed to believe the truth, that we have doubted your love and your mercy. 
And Lord, let us hear it again today. You care for us. Let us affirm that every night when our heads hit the pillow and every morning when our eyes open, he cares for us. And Lord, when the the enemy's lies take on their power, when the going is difficult, and Lord, when we are suffering, I pray more than ever we will hear those words from you. You care for us. And he who did not spare his son, we can trust him to give us everything that we need. Father, I pray today we will count you worthy of our obedience. To God, we would humble ourselves under your hand that is powerful and wise and gracious. To God, we will resist the enemy and not listen to his lies. We won't listen to him when he says he really doesn't care as much for you as you think. But Lord, we will put our trust in you. And Father, as we do, I pray that we will discover that indeed our sufferings in this life are but for a little while. And Lord, that we have every reason to be established, restored, confirmed, and strengthened in what Christ has done for us, the gift of eternal life and glory. Thank you, Lord. Let us live for you. Let us humble ourselves before you and let us believe you that you care for us. We ask it in Jesus' name together and we say, amen.